This is Dan Gandy, team leader of the operative group out here on the beautiful west coast of Eugene, Oregon. And today we're going to talk about everything you need to know about buying and selling and moving into a manufactured home. I am incredibly pumped to talk about this, not only as a park owner, as somebody who's closed millions of dollars in manufactured homes, not on real property and on real property, to show you the right way of buying manufactured homes and going through a few of the scenarios where it just doesn't make sense. But before we do that, please like, subscribe, follow me, ask as many questions as you can. It's all about collaboration and providing you as much value. And I wanna be a resource for anybody out there in the Oregon market when it comes to purchasing any type of real estate. So let's dive into it. Purchasing manufactured homes is not easy. As a real estate broker that's done new construction, investments, uh, luxury properties, land, you name it, I've probably done it at this point. I wanna say very clearly that purchasing manufactured home is pretty complicated actually. And the reason for that is because there's this property management aspect of the park and approvals and screenings and there's a real estate transaction going on simultaneously. So there's two components of this that are essentially like having an HOA, a landlord or a property management company and a real estate transaction going on and the dynamics of buyers and sellers and agents and, and lenders. So please, 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 please use this video, watch it all the way through. I think you'll find incredible value. So let's dig into it. Three types of parks in Oregon. First type of park, what we would call a designated senior community, 55 and over. You probably heard it. HUD has created this classification and 80% of the park must be occupied by people, people, residents over 55 and over, right? So if you're 32 years old and you just wanna move into that park and you think you're just gonna blast on through, doesn't happen. Second type of park, all ages. You can be one years old or 99 years old. There is no age requirement to be in that park. These are perfect for families. They're perfect for people who don't wanna deal with maybe a little bit more uh, uh, strict park rules. But I always say that family parks or all ages parks are a great place for people to find affordable housing. Third type of park, hybrid parks, right? This is an RV park mixed with a manufactured home park. It could be every other manufactured home and there is no rhyme or reason for how they're organized or it could be designated spot for RV park and manufactured home park. And we see that around town, especially in Crestwell and different places. But saying all of this, those are the three types of parks that you really wanna understand when you're starting your research on this process. Next, I wanna talk about property management law and park screening and applications. Like I said, these types of transactions, there's a little bit different expectation from your real estate agent. Do not rely on your real estate agent to answer all the questions about every single park that you want to look at because they don't know. They don't work for the park. They don't have the typically the park rules yet. It's like asking an agent to know every single HOA law or bylaw at every single community around town. It just doesn't happen. It's your job to do due diligence and go in there and ask the right questions to park management regarding the screening process, the park rules and getting a copy of it, understanding the specifics of items that are needed for the application process, how much it costs. And so in this entire park screening and application portion of this video, I want you to know that there's a lot of due diligence that a potential buyer or tenant needs to do. It's just like you, if you wanted to go out and rent an apartment or a home from somebody, you're gonna fill out the information that is required, you're gonna ask the right questions that you have, and you're gonna make sure that you have to go through the entire screening process and pay that screening fee for that specific application. Now, I'm gonna give you this advice a few times in this video and tell you that getting approved for the park prior to purchasing a home there may cost you 50 bucks, but may save you 500. And we'll talk about this at a later time in this video. But I just wanna let everybody know that the screening criteria for a park is the most important thing to start with. That's typically gonna be the income requirement. And how that works, it's, it's usually lot rent, i.e., well, for example, $500 a month. You must make 3X that in gross income. Sometimes it's cleared income, sometimes it's gross income. Every park is different. 
but the screening criteria when it comes to the income requirement is typically gonna be based on a multiple of the lot rent. Second thing you need to understand is your rental history or home ownership history. Have you been evicted? Have you been foreclosed on? Have you declared bankruptcy? Did you have a ton of property crime, right? Criminal record is not what I'm going into, but what I'm talking about is your rental record or home ownership record that does come in and, and plays a big part of that screening criteria. Another aspect would be the credit score and having a, uh, a minimum level of credit score. And there are some, some parks that will let things slide. There's other parks that say, if you don't hit this credit score, you're just not even gonna be considered. But typically paying that application fee, filling out the application in full, getting any required documents, tax statements, uh, uh, pay stubs, any of that information is required to get through the screening process. So don't put it on the real estate agent and say it's their fault that it's taking so long or you didn't fill it out for three days. It's not the real estate agent's fault when they've come into this whole entire process and let you know that going through screening for any type of rental property or any type of financial interrogation, it just sucks. And I wanna build some credibility here, guys. I own parks, I have an MSD number, which is the Manufactured Structured Dealership number, and I also am a real estate broker, and I've sold millions of dollars in manufactured homes. And you don't know how many times people have tried to put it on me that it's the park or the screening process is, is not going well, right? It's because they're not asking the right questions, they weren't proactive about it, they waited to the last minute, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And I just wanted to address that because I've seen it all through these millions of dollars in transactions and owning a park. So making sure you get the park application quickly, making sure you fill it out, get all the required documents, and if there's anything else you need to follow up on, just do it, that's it. Next, I wanna talk about getting pre-approved versus waiting. And I see this a lot. I get a call, somebody wants to go see a showing at a manufactured home, and I say, hey, if you like this park, you should probably fill out the, the, the park application and get pre-approved or pre-park approved. Don't wanna, I don't wanna confuse you with financing that we will talk about. But having that pre-approval for the parks that you like is critical in moving the ball forward. It actually can make, make you close quicker and What's the difference between spending $50 a few times and then losing $500 on inspection and then figuring out you didn't get approved for the park anyways? So we'll talk about it a little bit further, but understanding that your tenant, understanding that you are a tenant and you own a home on rented land means that you have to understand the dynamics of they are not gonna fix your toilet, they're not gonna fix your faucet. It's you that's responsible for mowing your yard and making sure that you take care of your property, both the exterior and interior, especially the exterior when it comes to park rules or standards, when it comes to roof, siding, paint, windows, or trash accumulation or any of that stuff. So when it comes to park screening and applications, what you're trying to figure out is what are the screening criteria? What are the rules in the park rules? Should I wait to get a park approval or do I really like this park? What's the lot rent? What's the pet policy? And what's the parking situation going to be? And if I have a boat or an RV, do they have options for that? Do they offer storage? You're trying to do as much due diligence as possible during that screening and park application process. It is your turn, your job to make sure that you're doing that, not your real estate broker. Now, if you're selling a home and you're trying to move into a manufactured home, that whole downsizing process should probably start about six months ahead of time. The reason for that is selling your home and purchasing a manufactured home in a park is actually has several layers of logistics, especially when it comes to the financing or the feasibility of how you're gonna pay. The first thing you're gonna do as a real estate broker is you're gonna go out and assess your current home and run a comparative market analysis, what we call a CMA. We're gonna pull comps, we're gonna try to see if we were to list this property, how much would we list it for and what would it probably close within plus or minus 5%. Next, we're gonna to try to create a net to seller analysis. A net to seller analysis is they're gonna ask you what your mortgage loan balance is. Don't not tell them this because it's gonna help them in this whole process. And they're gonna look at what they're potentially gonna sell the property for, minus the realtor fees, minus the closing costs, minus your mortgage you have in place and how much equity you're gonna have and if that equity is enough to set up a search and buy 
complete all cash on that manufactured home. So when you're downsizing from a single family home to a manufactured home and cash purchase is going to be the ultimate goal, that like CMA, that net to seller analysis and hiring a great agent is gonna make a world of difference, guys. I can't stress that enough. I see so many people just go with the agent that they may have met at an open house or the person they know from church, but they know nothing about manufactured homes in the process. They don't even have the license to do it. And they've never really sold a lot of houses, so they have no clue how to run a CMA, no clue how to get you a net to seller analysis so you can make a smart, informed property search and purchasing decision. So that's how we start to create the downsizing plan. It's first that assessment of your real property. If you're renting, we'll talk about that in a second. Next is creating the top five parks that you would like to possibly live in. How do you first start that? Do some Google search, find out where the parks are. Next, get in your car, drive around. If they're gated, call the park. This isn't gonna be included in your park due diligence process, right? Talking to park owners, see if you can get a tour scheduled. If they don't even wanna schedule a tour or you don't, can't get access, then how would you ever move in there if you don't even know if you like the park? That is key. Also doing this due diligence process of driving around and creating that top five list is you're also writing down the park lot amounts. So if you know what the lot rent is, sorry, lot rent, you're gonna make sure that you're classifying what parks you like and which ones are not gonna work for your budget and which ones are gonna work for your budget, regardless of what you're selling your house for and buying this at, right? Still gotta make sense. You're gonna gather all that information, rank your top five parks, and then you're gonna have that conversation about timing. When should I list my house? And then how should we write up that listing so that we can protect myself in finding the replacement property? So I wanna talk about two contingencies. Contingent, contingent upon seller finding a replacement property. That's the first, contingent upon seller finding a replacement property. What that ultimately means is that a buyer can write an offer on your house, but they have to be okay with you selecting, identifying, and finding the replacement property before their contract will actually be executed in full. And so this is a great way to protect yourself if you are relocating out of the area, especially. But if you're moving and trying to locate and find that right manufacturer, home. and what that would mean is that you would accept their contract, it would go pending on your home, but then you would write an offer pending on another home contingent upon your house closing over here. So you remove that contingency and now this person has faith, the seller of the manufactured home, that you actually have the proceeds or the ability to purchase and close on their home. So that is a contingency of the seller finding a replacement property. The second type of contingency or deal structure would be you to basically negotiate a rent back. Now it's a little bit more risky, but every relocation buyer seller should be understanding how a rent back works. An agreement to occupy after closing means that the property, your home that you live in has sold, you have re realized the equity and proceeds and now you have the cash in the bank, but now you have two to four weeks, whether free or not free, to live in that home to get the logistics and waiting for maybe potentially the seller of that manufactured home to move out. So sometimes it's a balance of timing, right? When we're doing a dual transaction, not dual agency, dual agency is when one agent represents both parties. But when you're doing a dual transaction, and I call dual transactions when a client calls me and says, hey, I wanna sell this property, but I wanna buy another one. There's some logistics and timing. What happens if this seller can't move out for four to six weeks? You need a rent back over here. If you can't move in with family, or you can't move your stuff to storage, there's a bunch of different things that have to happen in terms of having a real estate agent that understands how to work dual transactions. And I wanna be very clear here, dual transactions are not easy. So making sure you understand those contingencies or agreement to occupy after closing is going to be key in this process. Next thing I want you to understand is how cash sales compared to financing sales, okay? Obviously cash is king, everybody wants to pay with cash, but sometimes when you look on the MLS or you look at a for sale by owner of a manufactured home, it says cash only. So if you're using a loan to purchase this replacement property, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, sometimes that seller won't even accept your offer if it has any type of financing whatsoever. So if you're paying with cash, you have leverage to do typically as fast of close as 10 days. That is gonna be key if you're doing, selling a home and doing a dual transaction because you can close on this home quicker, right? You can actually be selling this home with a 
two week rent back and close on this home in 10 days now that you have these proceeds. And so that gives you an, an opportunity in which you can keep your rent back under two weeks because 10 days, typically not 10 business days, just 10 days is less than 14 days, which is two weeks. So cash sales are gonna be the preferred cash sales and using that equity is gonna be a big, big, big way of downsizing and being able to not have a mortgage, but also it's gonna allow you to have no appraisal and it's also gonna be able to give you more leverage when negotiating. So cash sales with manufactured homes are super common and also the terms that are typically offered are always cash, okay? Now for the homes that are for sale, manufactured homes, that do allow financing. I wanna talk about financing for a second. Financing when it comes to manufactured homes comes down to a few things. If it's on real property, it needs an engineering report, it needs to be strapped or seismic straps, I think that's what it's called, strapped to the foundation is what we do call it as a real estate agent. And you're gonna get an engineering report that verifies that. And if it's on real property, a lot of lenders won't lend on it if it's older than 20 years from today's date. And so manufactured homes not in a park typically will finance conventionally, FHA, VA, conventional loan, but it can't be more than 20 years, 25 years. They typically have some sort of a uh, time frame, and it has to have an engineering report to show that it has structural integrity and it's not going to slide off its foundation if there's an earthquake. So that's if you're buying a manufactured home on real property, standard loan process. But in a park, the complexities now turn up. The reason for that, it's collateralized different, right? They cannot foreclose on that house and take the property. So what you're doing is you're buying a, a basically a title, a car or a vehicle or a manufactured home that does not own the property that's underneath it. And so its value is in the structure, the improvement only and not the land and improvement. And what that means when financing is if that home is older than 1976 and does not have a HUD plate, that means that manufactured home has different standards and has not been a part of the HUD uniform standards that were post-1976. So some manufactured home lenders won't even allow you to have a loan on anything older than 1976. And there's a date, June 14th, June 16th, somebody will correct me, but I always forget because my birthday is July 14th and it muddles my brain. But what I'm trying to say is that if that home is older than 1976, there's a lot of lenders that just won't do it. Now there are lenders that do, 21st, mortgage company being one of them. And that's how they've made a killing. That's how they've created a massive market share and a monopoly almost. Sorry, I'm just gonna say it. They have, they're the biggest lender in the United States because they will lend on pre-1976 manufactured homes, not on real property. Now, if it's older than 1976, 1977, there are credit unions and other local banks that sometimes will, will treat those kind of like a car loan or a chattel loan but I wanted to make sure that you understand that there will be an appraisal and you have to understand the lot rent plus mortgage payment analysis. What this means is that you're gonna have a down payment requirement. You're gonna have a earnest money that has to go in. So down payment is 10 grand, earnest money is a thousand. You're putting 11,000 down on a $100,000 manufacturer home, for example. And typically you're gonna have a higher interest rate. It could be nine, 10, 11, 12% versus five, six, seven percent on a conventional loan. But the biggest piece of information that I wanna share with you guys is that sometimes it just doesn't make sense to own a manufactured home like I pretty much said at the beginning of this video. If you own a home free and clear and you have no monthly mortgage payment and now you're going to purchase a manufactured home that has a $500 lot rent every month and you wanna finance this property and not burn through all of your equity or cash, if that mortgage payment say is 750 a month or 900 bucks a month plus your 500 bucks a month, now you just went back to a $1,500 a month payment because you have a lot rent that doesn't go towards equity or anything. It goes towards buying time to live in that park, right? Your ability to have your manufactured home on that lot plus your financing. If you had utilities on there, sometimes you're at 16, 17, 18, $2,000 a month. So you went from not paying any mortgage payment, just property taxes and homeowners insurance, to now having PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance, plus lot rent. Now it financially doesn't make sense. So 
analyzing that is super huge. I will be 100% honest with people, and I've literally told buyers before, after showing three or four homes, getting them over to a lender, getting them pre-approved, and the first thing they say to me is like, Dan, you were right. It's more than my rent that I'm currently paying. So then you have to weigh your options. Is moving into a manufactured home and having that, that, that's, that feeling of home ownership and pride or location or convenience or amenities or pace of life more important than paying more than what you pay in rent right now. Now, a lot of times, a lot of markets, that's not gonna be the case. But in some other markets, like I lived in Santa Cruz, California, there were some parks that were $2,500 lot rent. Imagine if you added a $100,000 loan on top of that at 700 bucks, you're paying thirty-two dollars to $3,500 a month. But rent in the area for a one bedroom apartment that you could live in was 18, 1900, right? So you gotta do that analysis. I've told buyers before, it just doesn't make sense in your current situation. A lot of times it has to do with how much down payment you're gonna use from the, the sale equity or the equity from your sale, because that's gonna buy down your interest rate or it's gonna create a, a way bigger principal reduction. So buying a manufacturer home has to have some financial analysis on do it, does it make sense? Now, understanding contingencies with a manufactured home. Now in the Oregon, we have a separate sale agreement for buying a manufactured home in a park. And that specific purchase agreement has an auto contingency for park approval. And what that means is that you fill out an application. Now, pause, time out. I told you to fill out the application and get pre-approved, parked approved, prior to buying or writing an offer because it saves so much time. Now we're gonna fast forward back here and I'm gonna talk about why. If there's an auto contingency for park approval, some parks will not allow you to accept the offer until you're park approved. So what happens is you got a bunch of people that look at the house and then they go back to the park office, they fill out all the applications. And then next thing you know, within a couple of two to three days, you have a bunch of people that are either denied or approved. And I hate when parks do it this way because what happens is people think it's first come first serve and then their offer will get accepted. But when on the real estate side, it's not first come first serve ever. It's who has the highest offer and which offer does the seller want to accept. So what I'm telling, telling you about these auto contingencies for park approval is that you're writing an offer, but you don't know if you're gonna get approved by the park. But if you aren't approved by the park, you can terminate the transaction, get your earnest money back. That's what it means for me when I call it an auto contingency for park approval. I like to go in writing with a client that they are already pre-approved for the park and they're gonna go into that transaction knowing they don't even need to use that contingency, right? The second contingency is there is park rule approval. And what that means is that if you haven't got a copy of the park rules yet. Once they let you fill out an application, they're gonna give you a copy of the park rules. If you do not agree with the park rules or you have a dog that's too big or you discover anything in that due diligence process, because this has gotta be treated like a planned community addendum, but it's not, you're doing your due diligence just like you would if you're moving into a condo or a townhouse situation where there was an HOA with CCNRs. Meaning you're reading through those rules and if you don't agree with them, you're gonna back out of the transaction, get your earnest money back. That is the contingency regarding park approval. Now there are deadlines when it comes to how fast you have to fill out the park application and how long you have to review the park rules. So making sure that you understand the important deadlines, understanding which contingencies are built into that uh, is gonna allow you to navigate with an expert real estate agent that can help you work through this process. Now imagine this, you're selling your house, you're going and looking through offers, you're having showings, there's a lot of stress going on about selling your home, and you're also dealing with the stress of filling out a park application and basically going through a tenant screening process while reviewing park rules and making sure it all works for you and making the right decision, both if you're financing or you're buying with cash. So there's a lot of aspects. I wasn't joking when I said buying a manufacturing home is actually a very complicated transaction. And when I get uh, when I get the comments from other real estate agents like, why do you do those? The commissions are low. It's to help people, guys. I'm all about helping people. I don't care if it's $750 or $7,500 commission, but these are complicated transactions. And so why people put their trust in me is as a park owner, I know both sides of the story and I can help you proactively prevent any situations by doing your screening, doing your due diligence, creating that plan, getting your net to seller, making sure you know what comps are, making sure how you're gonna acquire that. Do you need financing? There's all of these situations right? All of these circumstances that need to be addressed. So 
buying and downsizing into a manufactured home, a lot of times is way more complicated than people actually understand. And so I want to watch, I want you to watch this video. If you need to re replay it, if you need me to uh, fulfill any more information that is uh, talks about utilities or talking about uh, specific uh, things that I see as problems that come in the park, reach out to me, right? I want to be an area expert. I want to tell you which parks have higher lot rent. I want to be able to tell you which parks uh, have great feedback from my past clients. Uh, typically, it's 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 this holistic approach of looking at how do I downsize when there's a limited inventory of condos and townhouses and I'm not interested in moving into those and I'm not interested in becoming a renter again. So what are my options to buy a manufactured home in a park that's going to work for your budget and you, yourself, and your family? So thank you so much. Like I said, Dan Gandy, The Operative Group, 458-209-0163. Follow me through all of my downsizing videos. I'm here to be a resource for you. And thank you so much. Take care.